Hi, this is Mike Spivey of the Spivey Consulting Group. It's December 6th, and numerous people had requested that we do a podcast on staying calm in a chaotic cycle, I guess is what we'll call this, but staying calm. And this podcast sort of addresses that from three perspectives. So I did want to give a brief outline. The first perspective is that even in this up cycle, as far as applications, there's some good data points and good news. We've addressed this before. So I just wanted to mention that I talk about it even more now. If you've heard our other podcast, maybe you've heard this before. It's never bad to hear again because there's good news. Part and parcel of the cycle has good news. The second part of this podcast, look, I am no expert on stress management because I don't have a psychology degree. I'm not the calmest human being on the planet, but I do research this stuff more and more as time goes on. I've learned about it. So the second part is a little bit more on the sort of biological comparative reasons for stress and then interventions that can be done to sort of mitigate spikes in stress. The third part to me is the most calming. Competitive cycles never really seem to change much. And I've even seen this at the most dramatic way. Even during recessions, when I was a dean of career services, long term, people got exactly what they had been aspirationally going for, you know, during the Great Recession. So I think what what I end on is sort of a note that even during this competitive cycle, there's, you know, still so much to be optimistic about as far as law schools and career outcomes. So let's get to the first perspective. It is going to be a long cycle. It's going to feel like a slow cycle. It's actually going to feel like a slow cycle to schools too, but right, who cares? It's going to feel like a slow cycle to a lot of applicants. Right now, as of today, I believe 32% of applications have been submitted, but that means like 10% of admissions decisions have have been rendered, maybe 15, so 85 to 90% to go. Applicants are going to come down. Applications are going to come down. And I highly suspect the ratio of applications to applicants will also come down. And LSAT scores at the top, although I don't think they're going to come down to the levels LSAC claims, they are going to come down soon. It happens every cycle. I mean, if nothing else, hopefully that's already calming because we have every bit of evidence to believe that those numbers aren't sustainable where they are. The other thing I do want to emphasize is I believe in aggregate enrollment is going to go up, possibly significant. So schools can do essentially the cycle one or two things or both. They can shoot for higher numbers or they can shoot for more revenue, which they need. This is a part of the equation I don't think applicants know nearly as much as, I guess, from the vantage point I see because I've worked at law schools, I've been in charge of budget committees, and I talk to law schools, and they have a dried up resource, that being their central universities that have been essentially underwriting them since the Great Recession that no longer have money to send to them. So law schools need more revenue. Now, they can do that in several ways. They can cut salaries, right? That doesn't give them more revenue, but it controls expenses. That's very difficult. I don't see it happening in this cycle. They can diminish the amount of scholarship they give because scholarship isn't really, it's not free money. You're just remissing part of your tuition. No different than if I'm a retailer and I get this plasma TV and I charge 5000 And then someone comes in and says, I want that plasma TV, but I can only afford it for 4000 So I say, sure, I'll sell it to you for 4000 You're not giving that person $1,000 of free money. You're just taking away part of the upsell price. Point being this, I also don't think that's going to happen this cycle. I think next cycle, you're going to start seeing merit aid decreasing pretty significantly. I think there's going to be a one-year lag in that happening. I won't get into why I think that. I don't want this podcast to go forever, and I could be wrong. So the only other way for schools to do this, and this is hopefully part of the calming process, is to increase the number of people at their law schools. And this is, I believe, going to happen. When we look at the data, when everyone enrolls in September and we start getting data, we're going to see a pretty significant jump in class sizes. What that means to you, and this is very important, is more admits. There will be many more people, I believe, admitted this cycle than last cycle. So even though the applications are up, I think we'll see a jump in enrollment like we haven't seen in a while. And even though it's gonna be a slow cycle, I think there's gonna be lots of happy people at the end of the cycle. So hopefully just the cycle dynamics are calming. I want to talk a little bit about sort of the biology of stress and how it relates to what a lot of, I think, applicants experience now, which is pretty interesting stuff. I'm going to cage it in a study, believe it or not, on old world versus new world primates. But this is highly relevant to all of us. 
So they measured cortisol level in much more advanced primates, baboons, and they measured cortisol level. By the way, cortisol is the stress hormone. They measured cortisol levels in much less advanced primates. They found out that what they would have expected is the exact opposite. So more advanced primates, baboons, live in secure groups. They have very high birth rates without morbidity. The closer these baboons are to humans, the more stressed they are, which was interesting. Why are these baboons with 10 times the cortisol level? Well, to begin with, why aren't they dropping dead out of trees from Cushing syndrome? But evolution is amazing and we adapt. But also why the closer they get to humans, the more stressed they are. Turns out that their feeding window, the amount of time it takes these baboons to gather food and intake food, is about two and a half to three hours a day versus old world primates where it takes them much of the day to get their food, eat their food. What does that mean? Baboons have 9 to 10 to 11 hours a day to interact with other annoying jerk baboons, hence their high stress level. What does that mean relative to us? We are, as humans, unlike ever before, spending 9, 10, 11, 12 more hours a day online interacting with others. What did they also find out with baboons? The least stressed baboons were the alphas of the groups, the ones that had life the easiest. How do I correlate this with what people are going through? It is stressful because you're always in a comparative mindset because of social media, because of message boards. And what you're seeing is a bunch of alpha baboons. Early cycle, it's all admits. And soon we're going to start seeing, hey, I just got my Harvard admit, my NYU admit. That is stress-inducing because stress is a comparative process. I feel really bad for the 12-year-olds today who not only get bullied at school, but then go home and sign on to Instagram and see what the cool kids are doing, the influencers. You know, everyone had a period of their life when they've been bullied. But if I, let's say when junior high, I got bullied for a month. I didn't go home and get bullied, but now it's like 24-7, and it's the same thing with the law school admissions process. And I bring this up because there is significant research that exists that interventions can help control stress. So what are those interventions? One would be not checking other people who you don't even know, or you don't even know if they're being sincere. Not checking other people's admissions results constantly. Because not only does that give you incidentally a stress when you see it, it gives you a carryover in cortisone spikes that lasts for a while. I'll give you an example. Four of us did a Zoom talk on character and fitness. And between the four of us, you know, 100 years admissions experience, we could only think of five examples where the character and fitness had said, this is a non-starter. They were like combination, academic dishonesty plus criminal fraud. So criminal and academic in the same move. So what happened for a week after that Zoom? I kept getting these direct messages to various social media. Hey, Spivey, I just listened to Zoom and I had uh, underage drinking when I was 17. Am I one of those five people that can't go to law school? So at first, the first couple were humorous and I would respond. And then, you know, after like 17, 20, 30 of these, I would try to respond, but I would get this cortisol spike. (laughs) Why did we spend an hour talking about how your character and fitness is not going to shut you out? And all these people with these extremely minor character and fitness issues are emailing me in a state of panic. And what I realized is I would get this momentary cortisol spike of like, oh my God, another one of these. But then it would carry over. And like for the next 30 minutes, hour, I would be less likely to just sit down, calm Calm my ass down and pleasantly respond to the people who understandably don't know admissions and were worried. So, you know, one intervention I did that worked for me is I was like, okay, I'm just going to check my Reddit direct messages once a day. But if I were to check my email four times a day, I wouldn't keep getting these cortisol stress things. That's something I would highly encourage. Some of you are going to pull this off and it's going to be amazing. Most won't because I don't think I could. If you can just give yourself maybe one or two checks of your application status tracker, one or two checks a day of Reddit. Give yourself, I wrote a blog on this on spiveyblog.com. It's called Load Management Day. I literally do this once a week now. On Sundays, I delete all my social media apps from my phone and I don't check Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. The amazing thing about that is it carries over Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So Sunday is like bliss on tap for me, spending time with people I care about and my new puppy and whatever. But on Monday, I'm a much calmer person when I get away from it all. Again, I get away from that comparison. Other interventions, again, the research is just really, really significant. 
significant here. I'll give an example. This is not stress. This has to do with depression. I'm not a psychologist. I have no training. So I only know one study, but it turns out that people who are experiencing depression, the second they make an appointment with a therapist, their depression subjectively is measured lower because they've already committed to an intervention. They've already said, okay, I'm taking control of my destiny. So if you say this cycle is stressing me out and you get to pick your intervention, for me, it would be trail running, right? But for you, it might be drawing or journaling or podcasting, writing, lifting weights, playing a sport, spending time with friends. All of those healthy things produce dopamine in the best kind of way, the good kind of dopamine. Not the kind of dopamine that's, I'm gonna go out on a Friday night and have six tequila shots and then go check Reddit. Because incidentally, that creates a lot more stress the next day. I'm certainly not gonna turn this podcast and being calm on a, you shouldn't enjoy life. But I do think that there are many healthy interventions out there. Anything that you aspire to do, that you look forward to do, that's healthy, will get you a little bit away from this cycle. If you can make it a habit, it'll get you further away from the cycle because it's going to be a slow cycle. But let me finish on this note, which I hope is the most calming element of all of this. It's the following. People, including me, get caught up in this is better than that by others' arbitrary sort of rating systems, which is what rankings are, which is why incidentally we created that MyRank, MyRank by Spivey.com, where you can rank law schools based on what you care about and throw out things like, you know, peer citations and faculty journals and stuff like that. What I want to say is this. A lot of people listening to this podcast, and I say this in the most sincere way possible because I've seen it in my 20 plus years doing this. I've seen former students of mine who are now doing just amazing, incredible things. Students of mine from Vanderbilt, students of mine from Washington University in St. Louis, and students of mine from Colorado. No different. They went to different law schools, different rankings. They're doing amazing things. People listening to this podcast, incidentally, you, right? This could be you, are going to go on to be Supreme Court justices, possibly. Definitely people applying to law school. People listening to this podcast are going to be hiring partners, managing partners, practice area heads at big law firms. They're going to work in federal agencies, government offices, run for politics successfully, do things so much grander than we can even conceptualize right now. I mean, like infinitely grander than anything I've done in my career. And it doesn't necessarily have to start off with a Harvard Law School admit. We get so wrapped up in rankings, right? So I guess the final thing I would say is ask yourself, is my aspiration Harvard because it's what I want or what society is telling me is right? I've had so many people I've gotten close to get into Penn and not Harvard or get into UVA and not Penn. And almost to a T, I, I guess I can't say every one of them, but the vast majority a year later, send me emails that say, you know, I thought Spivey I was going to transfer, but I love it here at Penn. I love it here at UVA. If it's not your top choice, know that most people don't get into their absolute dream school and they succeed and they thrive. A year later, they see themselves nowhere else. The pressure to get into these schools because of their ratings so often come from that comparative process. It comes from society or people around us and not ourselves. I would be happy for you all to get into a law school where you will thrive at. And the fact of the matter is, almost everyone listening to this is gonna get into a law school this cycle where they thrive. I know it doesn't seem that clear now. I'm lucky in that I'm 48 and I've done this for over 20 years, so I've seen this happen so many times. The 21-year-old version of me wouldn't believe what I'm saying right now, but what I'm saying is it's going to be all right, even in a competitive cycle, even if you don't get Yale Law School. The fact that you're taking the time to listen to this random stranger blather in a mealy mouth way for 17 minutes means you're dedicated to the process. And if you're dedicated to the process, long-term results are going to be exactly what they want them to. This was Mike Spivey with the Spivey Consulting Group. I hope this was helpful.